So I asked myself the question, how does a devastated man survive? Myself and my twin brother John, we had three passions. The military, motorcycles and rock music. We'd served in the military together, we'd served in Lebanon together and we'd served in the special forces together. And I just felt really completely and totally betrayed. It was like this in Lebanon. One minute it would be as quiet as a mouse, nothing happened, and then all hell would just break loose. I wasn't wound tight anymore. What I actually found was that I was unraveling. The people that love me the most, I hurt them the most. And they got the full blunt of the pain and the revenge I wanted for what was done. If God is real and he speaks, what is he to say to me? These battles rage on, whether you're overseas, on deployment, or you're home. Battles go on all the time. Peace is not the absence of strife and conflict. Um, it's knowing where to turn in the midst of it. I couldn't die that night. And I couldn't tell anyone. There are things that we saw in those dark moments which are just very, very difficult to describe. I spent the first half of my life trying to figure out why am I here? You know, what's the purpose of my life? You know, I mean, why was I born in the first place? That void inside, that, 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 you know, something needed to fill it. I just felt, even after that, I can't get out of this. This is, there's no way out of this at all. This is going to be with me forever, like. The circumstances hadn't changed. I still lost everything, but now I had this, just had this peace that everything was going to be okay. There's a military term where it says you're on your chin strap, which means you can't give anymore, you can't do anymore. I've tried everything. Before I know the plans I have for you, not for evil, but for good, to give you a hope and a future. PTSD is no longer a wound that hurts me, but it's a scar that reminds me that I'm victorious. I've come out the far side of that. This was my justice. I was free. Everyone leaves a legacy. We can't choose if we leave one. Only what we leave. Good morning, Prairie Heights. Morning. You'll probably grasp by my accent I'm not from here. <laughs> so, um, hands up how many people have visited Ireland? Have ever been to Ireland? Oh, there's a few. Good stuff, so at least you understand me then. I won't need subtitles. Um, so I'm, go I'm gonna start with a bit of Irish. I'm gonna start with a bit of Irish. We're gonna have the first slide. So I'm gonna teach you a little bit of Irish. So you you'll grab something of my country today. So, dia gwit. That's a greeting that we use in Ireland for close friends, and it means God be with you. So now I'm gonna give you a chance to speak some Irish if you haven't done it before. So, dia gwit. Dia gwit. Let's go again. Dia gwit. Dia gwit. Impressive. And God be with you too, for sure. And I, and I know that Prairie Heights, since I got here, is a high five church. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, we have a language for that too. It's called Ard Cuig. Cuig in my language is five. 
So art is obviously high five. Um, yeah, so here we are. I, uh, we've had, in Ireland, we've had, I need these now at this stage. In Ireland, we've had nine of your US presidents visit our country. And um, 23 of your US presidents claim Irish heritage. And on the visits of your nine presidents to my country, um, they would do what I've just done there. They would learn some Irish and they would open their address to our people, um, and we would appreciate it, um, with Irish language. But I and others would realize that as Americans, that's not their native language, that's not your native tongue. It's a language that has to be learned. So, I, so primarily today, I'm here for people who are non-believers, people who don't have a relationship with Christ, whether you're looking in online or whether you're here, praise God, I'm delighted if you're here, if somebody hoodwinked you into coming here. But um, because I can relate to that story. So I'm going to speak today. When you hear me speak about God today, that was a language for 41 years that wasn't my language. God had to take hold of me. People had to disciple me and I had to learn that language. So what was my natural language? You probably got some detail from the video that I, I am a military guy and my brother, my twin brother, Jar and Kevin are military guys also. So we were comfortable with a language that was mainly swearing. Uh, me personally, it was a language of words of anger, words of confrontation, and words that isolated me from both my wife and my family and from others. If we could have the second slide, please. So not only am I going to use a language that was alien to me at one time, I'm going to read from a book that was alien to me at one time. And I have that very book here. It's called The Warrior's Bible. This was presented me, to me on an opportunity we had as a boat face to speak in the Pentagon, which was an awesome experience. So the, the deputy chaplain at the time, chief of chaplains, um, presented that to me. Um, but see this book here, for me, this book doesn't, it's the word of God, I believe that with my whole heart. And um, this book doesn't try to convince me that God is real or that God exists. It starts with in the beginning God. So this book declares, declares that God is real. Um, so I've come to you today, why am I here today? So I've come 4,000 miles. Um, I'm just a regular guy, that's all I am. But God did an amazing work in my life. Now I have a story, and when I met Beth and the About Fest team, Beth chronicled that story. I know when I look out at you guys and girls here that you have a story. I just get an opportunity today to tell my story. And I'm thankful for that. Um, being a military guy, if all the power was to go and we had to abandon this building right now, right now, if I got to speak no more of this message, what I want to say to people who are and don't have a relationship with Christ, it's never too late. It's never too late. And you're never gone too far. And for people who are praying for people like that in your family or in your neighborhood or in this church, my life is a testament to the fact that it's never too late and you're never gone too far. So will you hold on to that for me? Hold on to that. Now, before I get any attack of pride by the fact that I can share my message with you, when I read this book, I'm, uh, I see that there's a, a historical event recounted in it where God used a donkey to bring a message. So that, that, that puts me in my place immediately. Um, so if we can have slide number three, please. Um, yeah, so look, that's a picture of me and one picture of me in my military days. So for, for service personnel here, um, a little bit of my story, I, I spent 13 and a half years on active duty with the Irish military. I'm a grunt. I started in infantry, 3rd Infantry Battalion B Company. Um, and after serving there for a little while, I moved on to um, Special Forces. Um, 
The military trained me for different jobs, guys. Um, uh, one of my jobs was hostage rescue. Hostage rescue. Um, I'm always been the type of guy, I need a mission. I think most men, and in fact, maybe women are like that too. We need, we need a, a defined mission. In our lives right now, I'm on a defined mission, doing what I'm doing now. But that wasn't always the way. So um, just to go back to my role in hostage rescue, I had a clear mission, and that mission was to execute a rescue and safe return of people to their loved ones while apprehending or neutralizing an enemy. Now, why do I throw that in there? Because I didn't realize, I was trained as, as hostage rescue and I didn't realize as the years went by that I needed rescue. I tell a story, I fly a lot. I get to travel a lot internationally, praise God, and I fly. And um, uh, on the teams, in the teams, my MOE, my method of entry, if you were a hostage on an aircraft, uh, I'm a little guy, so everyone has their place in the team. So myself and a guy called Billy, we're of the same height, there is two of us. And um, so my method of entry would be port left, first door. So there are, if you've traveled on aircraft, there are four doors, four overwing doors that collapse in. And um, so my job was quite clear. Um, I was to get on that wing with my number two as quick as I could, get in that overwing door. And if you were standing anywhere near the cockpit area, that's where I was sweeping. Um, I would neutralize you. You know, we use small arm weapons, nine mil, and my particular weapon was a Sig Sawyer, and I had a, a red bead uh, as an aiming marker. Now, what I didn't realize was I made poor choices on, when I left the military. There's an enemy that has a red bead on me. He had a red bead on me. And are, are you familiar with um, Stockholm Syndrome? Anybody? Okay, um, that's all right. So when I, when I was in the military and we, we went about hostage rescue, we had natural enemies um, or threats such as somebody firing back at you uh, or booby traps, depending on, 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 on um, you, you know, what, whether it was a train or a plane or things like that. But there was a subtle enemy, threat. And that's where Stockholm Syndrome comes in. Stockholm Syndrome, in its simplest terms, is where you identify with your captor and his agenda. I know I'm talking to people today that can relate to that. Where you, you, you identify with your captor and his agenda. And Stockholm Syndrome is a very real thing because in 1973, Stockholm in Sweden, there was a bank robbery and um, a number of people were taken hostage and they spent six days in a vault with their captors. When the hostage rescue team came to free them, they resisted, they resisted. And it, when these guys were eventually captured, when it went to court, these people who were held hostage wouldn't, wouldn't give evidence. So why do I tell you that? Because that was me. And if you're not walking with Christ today, that's you. You're being held hostage. And there's an agenda for your life that your captor has for you, and you're, you're living to that. Can anybody relate to that? I think maybe. So a, a series of poor life choices. Um, I, um, so April 16th, 1994, I was deployed in the Middle East um, with a quick reaction team a guerrilla group which we're very familiar with today called the Hezbollah, attacked a particular area where I was, and um, some stuff went on there that wasn't pretty. And we retained that stuff, and we live with that stuff, but we bring that stuff home. My wife said on that deployment, her husband never came back. Myself and Karen, my wife for 40 years, were childhood, we were childhood sweethearts at 16. She married a guy with long hair, playing drums in a rock band and ended up, for the majority of her life, married to a guy that she didn't know at all. And I volunteered for that. So these things happen. It's how we deal with them, for sure. While I was overseas and while I was deployed also on that particular mission, my father died. I love my dad. And I deployed on an October evening, and uh, my dad was a, a little guy, and uh, 
a real man's man, and he would have instilled in me and my brother as children that nobody will give you anything in life. You must fight for it. And uh, so it's never nice going away, but I, I had said goodbye to my parents numerous times, and uh, so I went to their house, and I went to... Uh, I said goodbye to my mother. You know, mothers, God bless them, we love them. Uh, she was all tears and all this kind of stuff, and when we appreciate that. But my dad was out mysteriously painting a fence, probably for the 15th time. So as he didn't have to do this, this face-to-face thing, he wasn't good at that. So I remember leaving the house, and he fist-pumped me on the shoulder and said, you know, we use a language, he said, don't let those guys slot you. In other words, don't let those guys take you out. I never seen him again. And that broke me, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm a father now, and uh, I love my boys. And it, there was a plan going for me with this hostage plan of identifying with the enemy because I left the military and I went down a bad road, poor choices. Um, and the consequence of, I mean, we can choose things, can't we? I made lifestyle choices, both for me and my family. But I, where I was, in, I was empowered to make the choice. I wasn't empowered for the consequences of the choice. As I say, me and, me and Karen are married 40 years. Um, she's an ordinary Irish woman. If you know anything about an ordinary Irish women, they're teak tough. And she had to be to, uh, to track with me. And I thank God for her, for sure. And when I come here, my wife is blind now. Uh, that happened over the last 10 years. And Gary Opp would know that when, you know, I, I'm... I'm, I'm here a couple of days. I'm over a week here now, and I miss home. I miss her, and I miss uh, my boys. They're all men. But um, she would remind me, make it count. I'm sacrificing yet again for you to be in America and be on mission. Just make it count. See, I would see this church here as an outpost. I view everything through military goggles still. You can't take the army out of the van, I suppose. So Scripture tells us that we're in enemy territory. Satan is the king of this world for a little while. You only have to turn on the news to see that. But the God of this book tells us that. So Satan, he's got he's to he's do stuff. He knows his day is coming. So when I talk about hostage rescue, and I'm talking to you if you're looking on or you're sitting here today as being a hostage, I'm here to expose him as, as the guy who has taken you hostage, Satan, this enemy of ours. And how you identify with his agenda is by saying he doesn't exist, or I'm okay, or that's not me, or that message is for someone else. What I did, guys, was I isolated. There's a reason why solitary confinement is a punishment. Satan wants that for us. God has a different idea entirely. So Mike Little, some of you might know who Mike Little is. The other night we were in Cass County Jail. And um, so Mike Little talks about this. He said that, and I'm quoting now, we are at war, we're waging war. Immediately he had me when he said that. Not against drug addiction, not against violence, not even against crime. We're waging war against the root causes of these things. So criminals, Inmates, you, you guys that I'm talking to today, you're not the enemy in this war. You're not the enemy. Mike goes on to say that these people are hostages, held captive by an enemy. And part of my role and part of my mission today is to expose and point to that enemy, but most importantly, to point to the ultimate rescuer of hostages, which is Christ Jesus, the only one that can set us free. If we can have the next image, please. See, I was a hostage. And as you're reading this, this is a quote. Like, we're like books. People only see this. Some people will come up and talk. Other people will believe what other people say about us. But few will know the content. But the one guy who who does know us inside out who made us is the God who loves us and wants us back. So if you suffered any of that stuff about you know, people judging you and all of that, there's a God that knows us and he wants us back. 
So if you're a hostage today, and I think you might be if you're not tracking with his God, he sees you. He sees you. So we're gonna go to the next slide, please. This is an intentional slide. This is the cover of our book that Bethany wrote about face. It has f- intentionally has four people carrying the one. And I got to a stage in my life where I had enough. I had enough. But where do you go? What's the next step? I, as I said, I have four wonderful sons and uh, as, I, as I'm speaking here today, obviously there's a time difference with Ireland. My two, I have two sons that are pastors and they just finished preaching today the word of God. And I actually came to Christ through my older son. So my sons, Jamie and Sam, um, are pastors. And I have Rudy and Adam as well. They're my buddies. So when I was living a life outside God, let me paint a little picture. When I was living a life outside God, our home was a very violent place. I was angry all the time. I'd been diagnosed with post-traumatic, didn't really know what that was. Um, and I medicated that with Jack Daniels whiskey and class A drugs. I wanted to hide. I hated myself, I hated the world, and I seen everybody as a threat, but I was actually trapped. And in our book, we talk about everyone has an about face moment. Sometimes we have many of them. When I talked out with the military base the other day, I said, look, you guys started your about face moment when you swore an oath, signed on the dotted line, because you went through basic and you changed. Your thought process changed, how you look changed, and your perspective changed. You're, you become warriors for your country. So, so I was a violent person, and my oldest son, Jamie, became a Christian at 16. 16, and I was absolutely not happy about that. That's putting it mildly. Um, I seen it as a betrayal. He was a really good rugby player, if you know what rugby is. And I had, I had a different design for my son. And I was thinking, I didn't raise any of my boys, and I wasn't doing a good job raising them anyway, but I didn't raise any of my boys to become weak. And to me, I associated wrongly Christian, Christianity and following Jesus as something weak. So Jamie was a brave boy. He's actually my pastor today. So look at that. But he, uh, he left our house. He had to. I pushed him out. He was gone. He wasn't getting any money from me. I was in the clubs at the time. So all of our income basically went with, uh, with, with me with, with putting what you call gas in the tank of the bike and all that kind of stuff. But God already had the plan like he has a plan for all of us. Jeremiah eleven twenty nine 29 tells us that. And Jamie took a part-time job in McDonald's and thank God for women because he met his future wife, his wife now there, and she was a Christian lady. And she spoke the gospel message to him and he got saved through her. Her father was a pastor and a missionary in Ireland and thank God for her. But then Jamie would ring me on the phone and tell me, here's this alien language that I spoke about. He'd say, Jesus loves you. He even bought me a Bible and put John 8, John 8 in it. The knowledge of the truth will set you free. That was like reading Turkish to me. It didn't mean anything to me. And um, funnily enough, he tells the story that I would, and generally I would hang up on him when he made a call like that. But then at two or three or more in the morning, when we're really vulnerable, and I was pretty out of it, I would nearly always call him and tell him uh, that I loved him, and, which I do. So I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm the father, I've, I've lived life, I'm this SF guy, I've done this, you know what I mean? What's the 16 year old boy? But you see, when God enlightens us, that's real wisdom. That's real wisdom. And he knew that his dad needed a savior long before his father did. Um, so can we go to next slide? Please. So the, the, the four guys being carried, or sorry, the four guys carrying the one was inspired by this scripture verse in Mark. So they came to him, 
bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed and on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. I didn't know it, but my son was part of that stretcher bearer for me. Um, His pastor was part of a stretcher bearer for me. So my about face moment in the short form was um, I got up on a Sunday morning like this with a really bad hangover. My son played in a worship group in church. He's a drummer. I'm a drummer. And um, I went there. I don't know why I went there. And, And it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now I'm glad I did. But when I went there, Jamie seen me and he said, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. And uh, so I parked the Harley outside and very quickly, I started to feel uncomfortable. Uh, Just as that quote said, I lived that quote with other people. I I, I looked at at these good Christian people and I was saying, I don't have any place among you. So if you're a non-believer today, I, I know you, I was you. I get that. I couldn't tell you one thing was said in the message. Um, I just wanted to get out of there because the Holy Spirit, he hadn't taken hold of me yet. And guys, I was about to get up and go because I felt I have no place here. And uh, four people, two men and two women came through the door. And this is why I love America because there were four American people. The two men were wearing vests um, obviously I'm into motorcycles as well and they were wearing vests and I seen that immediately as a threat so I think I met them halfway before they got into the building and I asked them who they were and they were American missionaries and they were I think two months in Ireland I can't remember the time frame two or four months in Ireland but that morning they were faithful to God and they got up and said Lord where should we go and worship today because they weren't attached to any church and they felt God, the Holy Spirit said to them, go to a town called Carlo. That's where I live, Carlo. Uh, about an hour from Dublin City. And, and so they Googled, where's Carlo? And there's quite a few churches in our town. And they said, but like, where do we go? And the short form is that they, they felt led to go to a church that met in a hotel. And, and that was our church. So God immediately had my number. Two of those men were veterans, Vietnam veterans. And um, so basically, between them explaining the gospel message to me, to me and my son and the pastor, um, I gave my life to Christ. And the most important thing happened after that then was they discipled me. They were my spiritual parents. They, they stayed on mission for, I think, another two years. And uh, so we need that. This was all alien to me. Um, so that's the, four, that's the four carrying the one, for sure. Um, you know, I'd love to tell you lots of things changed that day, but they didn't. It takes time, doesn't it? It takes time. I'll tell you what I did have. When my son prayed over me, when my 16-year-old son prayed over me, he laid hands on me, and I had what I never had. And it's a subtitle of our book, Peace. Peace because you end up fighting yourselves. If you're a hostage, if, you, if you're listening to this message today, if you're here, you know, you need peace. You know what it's like looking over your shoulder, talking to yourself in the mirror. It was you. So God meets us where we are, doesn't he? Not where we should be. I was nowhere where I should be, but he came after me. That's that hostage thing again. Um, so I'm going to go to next slide. So don't just take it for me about this hostage thing. This is what Jesus says. These are the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. If you're familiar, he stands up in the synagogue and he reads out Isaiah 61. Everyone has a mission. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us quite plainly what his mission is. He says the spirit of the Lord is upon him because he has anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Who's captive? A hostage is captive. 
and recovery of sight to the blind. If I was blind, I thought Christian people were weak people. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. One of our worship songs there really stood out to me, which was uh, Joy in the Morning. If you're an unbelieving man or woman here, or even looking online, this is the morning. Get it done now. We don't know we have tomorrow. And there are people relying on you like there are people. I was, I was the, the father in my house. I was a husband to Karen, but I wasn't. So there are, peop- there are people relying on us getting this right. If it's a lady here, there are people relying on you getting it right. So back to mission. When, when we look at that hostage rescue, I was only talking to Bethany about this in the green room before. So with that Stockholm syndrome, um, if I rescued you, um, I wouldn't know that you haven't been affected by the people who held you hostage. So I would flexi cuff you and drag you out like all the rest of them until I found out that you were a friendly source. So when we give our lives to Christ, it doesn't all go smooth because he, he was trying to develop our character. So you know what I mean? And he, he exposes things in us that we don't like and we don't want to give up. But guys, I'm going to finish here, if I can. Um, so I spent 41 years of my life, you know, men, we do crazy stuff, as women will know. I spent 41 years of my life being a rock. You know, every now and again, my, I suppose, the surface would get wet, but inside I was hard and dry. That's a pretty lonely place to be. And Christ says, you don't have to be there. So if we can put up the next slide very quickly. The authority I have for sharing this message with you today is in this scripture here. I speak this scripture to myself. So it's for by grace that I have been saved through faith. That not of me, not of me, but is the gift of God, not of works, lest I should boast and say, oh, I'm a great guy. But God tells me I'm his workmanship. I always was, but I've been held hostage by somebody else. And I'm created in Christ Jesus to do what I'm doing now. Good works that he prepared in advance for me to do, that I should walk in them. So I'm walking in that. And here's here's the way I want to finish this. Here's the last slide. This is an invitation from Christ Jesus to the hostages today. If you're a Christian person, and you're tracking with the Lord, praise God. But this is an outpost that you come to. But there are wounded on the battlefield outside of these doors. We need to go back and collect them. We need to go back and collect them. I was a broken, wounded man. And Christ Jesus saved my son, and he loved his father, just like our heavenly father loves us. It's okay. It's okay to give up and lie down. It's okay. So Jesus knows this. And from the message version, he offers us this. Are you tired? I was tired. I know there are people who are tired. Tired of the pretense. Tired of doing the same thing. Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Whatever you think about Christianity and about God. And if that's keeping you away from God, that's religion. But Christ says, come to me, get away with me and recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest, an active rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. So we can't do it on our own. We're we're tracking with someone who will show us how to do this, how to live this life. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. I can only tell you today that for 20 years, for 41 years, I was an enemy of God. For 20 years, you know, God has used me to, to do mission. It's an incredible life. It's an incredible life. And so I want to talk to the hostages as I finish. Why stay? 
Why stay bound? If your eyes were opened up today to the fact that you are a hostage, don't stay that way. Don't stay that way. As I said, solitary confinement, we isolate. You know, John 10.10 clearly tells us, John 10.10 exposes the enemy's agenda for our lives. It says it's to steal, kill, and destroy. Destroy our marriages, steal our relationships with our children. If, if we become Christian people, everything, is, uh, everything that ever happened to me is true relationship. Relationship with my son. Relationship with these four unbelievable American missionary people who sacrificed to come to my country. Relationship with our about face team. Relationship with you now. Now you're part of my story. And when I speak again, I'll talk about the people in Prairie Heights. I'll tell you this, there are cliches and maybe there are things you should say to appease people. I'm not like that. But I think if I lived in Fargo, I would go to this church because I see that through Beth and through the team here, that they just don't have a desire to see people saved. They're intentional about seeing people saved. And that's why I'm here today. So um, I wanna do this, if it's okay with you. I wanna give that, that's Christ's invitation to the hostages. If, there, if you're here or you're looking on online, you know, Jesus said, I'll park the 99 to come after the one. There's a one here. So I want the 99 to bow their heads and I'm gonna pray. And to the one, to the ones that are here, if you wanna get away from this hostage situation, you wanna give your life to Christ, all I want you to do is raise your hand and I'm gonna pray and you don't have to pray out loud because you're not praying to me. You're, you're speaking with God, maybe for the first time. Possibly not. So are we good with that? So if you bow your heads, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray. And for those that feel led by the Holy Spirit, that want to come into a life-changing relationship with Christ, please raise your hand. Only I can see you and only he can see you. And right now, what I, what I can see, he sees. But like that quote in the book, he knows your story much better than me. So Heavenly Father God, Lord, we love you. We acknowledge your presence here. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. Father God, I'm sorry if I've ignored you, if I've backslidden from you. I wanna do an about face moment with you. Lord, I wanna give my life to you. I wanna learn from you. I want to be a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better son. I want to spend eternity with you, Lord. I reject the enemy. And anywhere where I've come into agreement with that enemy, I turn now to the Lord Jesus Christ and I say, I want you, I love you, I give my life back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.